Hey everyone, this is Jason Key at Harvard Medical School with SB Grid. Thanks for signing on today. We'll go ahead and get started. So today it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Jesse Hopkins, who's joining us from um, MacChess, uh, the Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source. He's going to be telling us about um, analyzing small angle X-ray scattering data using RAW. So Jesse, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. So. Uh, as Jason said, my name is Jesse. I'm a postdoc here at the biological part of the Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source. And I'm going to be talking to you today about RAW and also demoing it a bit, which is a, a package we've developed for analyzing small angle X ray scattering data from macromolecules. So uh, I, here's an alternative title slide. Mostly, I wanted to mention that while I'm the current developer, this was the brainchild originally of uh, Soren Sku, and it owes a lot to him as well as the work I've done. So just to kind of get everybody on the same page and on the same footing, I wanted to start out by talking just about two slides about what SAX is and how you do it, and then moving on to the details of the program. So. Uh, small angle X-ray scattering is a structural probe with limited spatial resolution. But despite this limitation in the spatial domain, it's been growing in popularity over the years. As you can see from about in the last 15 years, there's been an incredible increase in the number of publications using small angle X-ray scattering data. And uh, the reason for this is that despite the fact that you can't get atomic resolution from it, uh, you can work on molecules in solution. You don't need crystals or labels. You can use a wide range of buffer conditions. And it allows you to study things that other structural techniques have difficulty with. So mixtures, complexes, flexibility, disorder, all of these things are, are questions that we can address with small angle X-ray scattering, but it can be harder to address with techniques like crystallography or cryo-EM. So uh, additionally, I think a large part of what's been driving the popularity is that Small angle scattering beamlines, home sources, and the software that you use to analyze the data has become more accessible to non-experts. And I think that's been really key in driving it. So I'm going to talk about software today. Uh, but so just my, my standard slide on how to do a SACS experiment. So you have an x-ray source that scatters from a sample. You collect that on a detector. Uh, and then typically what you'll do is you'll have proteins in solution or other macromolecules. You measure that, but since the, the scattering from this, unlike in crystallography, the scattering from this is, is very close to the background. You have to measure the background by itself, uh, measure the buffer curve, subtract the two, and that gives you the scattering from the protein alone. So kind of keep that in mind as I walk through what rock can do, and you'll see that the pieces I've just described and quite a bit more are all included in the, what the program can do. So uh, that's, that's my very brief intro to SACS. I know that actually SP Grid has a couple very nice lectures by Thomas Grant on SACS. So if you're interested, I highly recommend checking those out. Thomas is a great guy, and he does a very good job explaining these things. So with that little plug out of the way, uh, what is RAW? What is this program uh, and what can it do? So RAW is, as the title of this talk said, a program for analyzing biological small angle X-ray scattering data. It's designed to do several different tasks. Uh, it can take detector images, 2D detector images, and process those into 1D profiles. Uh, you can then take those 1D profiles and carry out kind of basic data reduction, like averaging and subtraction, and then initial analysis at the beamline for quality control, guinea fits for RG and I0, mole weight analysis, the things that tell you whether or not you're actually getting good data. Once you know if your data is any good, uh, you can then use the package to carry out a set of different advanced analysis. Uh, and it does this mostly by providing a graphical interface for the uh, EMBL Sphergen ATSAS package. And I'll show you what that looks like in a bit. Uh, in addition to those, it also provides basic and advanced uh, data processing for size exclusion coupled uh, small angle X-ray scattering. And again, I'll demonstrate that and talk a little bit more about what that technique is in a few minutes. The other thing I wanted to mention is that RAW is really designed to be easy to learn and use. Uh, that's one of the key features of it. 
And, you know, I, uh, hopefully I'm not tooting my own horn too much by saying that I think it really is. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with small angle X-ray scattering analysis, uh, the program, is, you should really be thinking of it kind of like primus or scatter in terms of what it can do and the, the different kinds of things it can do. So a little bit more detail then, digging down into this. Uh, so when we're working with detector images at the moment, we can handle 28 different types of images, including the standards that you'd expect, Pilatus, TIFF, CBF, uh, IGER files. You can mask and normalize these images uh, and then use that, calibrate them, use that to turn it into one-dimensional scattering profiles. Once you have those, as I said, you average, merge, subtract, rebin, interpolate, all the kind of standard things you'd expect you might need to do on these profiles. You can calculate RG and I0 from the Guinea I fit. There are four different methods for calculating molecular weight. Uh, there's two different ways to get uh, the indirect Fourier transform, a Bayesian approach, and then uh, the regularization parameter approach implemented in GNOM by the Svergen group. Uh, it can also run uh, GNOM, DAMIF, DAMIN, AMBMeter, uh, DAMAVER, several other things directly from within the program, so you don't have to you know, save your data out, go to the command line, run these bits. It'll do all that for you, including a bunch of the advanced features. Finally, as I mentioned before, you can easily process inline sex sex data, and we have advanced methods for analyzing sex sex data uh, to deconvolve overlapping peaks using evolving factor analysis, which is a, a nifty technique thought up uh, uh, first applied to sex data about a year ago by Steve Meisberger at Princeton. Uh, and it's a model-free way to extract out different components when you haven't achieved full separation from your sizing column. So I did also want to mention a little bit about what RAW can't do, because um, it's important to kind of manage expectations, right? RAW is not designed for advanced biological small angle X-ray scattering modeling, generally speaking. It can't do ensemble optimization. It can't couple with MD, it doesn't dock, doesn't model flexible linkers, things like that. That's not the goal. But all of the output from RAW is compatible with all these other popular analysis programs for SACS. And so whatever you do in RAW, you take it, you get it to the point where you're ready to apply your advanced analysis after doing all your basic quality checks and you're you know, averaging and getting it to whatever point you need to get it to. Then you can save it, put it in these other programs, and away you go. Uh, RAW is also not designed for analysis of non-biological systems. Really, you can do basic data manipulation if you want to, but we don't have any of the unified fitting or things like that that materials scientists tend to look for in a small angle X-ray scattering package. That's not our audience. So keeping that in mind, why should you use RAW? Well, uh, it's free and open source. It's Python-based. Uh, and I personally, I think that's a, a big plus for software for scientific purposes. You, you want to be able to go in and figure out exactly what it's doing uh, and to have the assurance that you, know, you can go under the hood and make sure it's using all the right bits and pieces if you need to. Most people won't bother, but it's there. Uh, it's also, as I said, easy to learn and use. Right? We've spent a lot of time designing it so novice users, when they come to our beam line, they have to learn how to collect data, they have to learn how to analyze data, they have to learn how to prepare samples, all these things. There's so much information. So this program is designed to be as simple as, it, as we can get it and you know get people up and running on their own within an hour uh, with all that stuff. It's got a detailed tutorial online. It's got an hour of video tutorials. It's got a manual. So all these things can really help you get started, even if you're not familiar with the program. It's also powerful. It's the only biosax focused software package that can go from images to P of R functions and envelopes all the way through. Uh, as far as I know, there's nothing else, at least uh, that isn't like a beamline pipeline. There's nothing else you can install on your personal laptop that can do that. So uh, it's also compatible. As I said, the data can be processed with the AdSAS package and other software packages like SASE or US SOMO. And so we're, we're, it's all very intercompatible, which is good. And finally, it's well established. RAW has been used uh, for over seven years by uh, hundreds, possibly even thousands of users just at our beamline and then other places around the world. It's actively used at 
the G1 SAX beamline here at MACCHESS, the APS BioCAT beamline, another SAX beamline, the Shanghai Synchrotron Radiation Facility beamline, BL19U2, a couple of MAX Lab scattering beamlines, and at various home sources, including uh, as the primary software shipped with the SAX Lab and Xenox home sources. So uh, it's been around a while and it's had some time to mature, which I think is a, an advantage as well. Then finally, though, I know if you're on here, you're probably using SP Grid, so installation stack taken care of for you. It is cross-platform and it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So uh, that's another advantage as well. So uh, then how, how can you learn more if you want to? Well, you can go to the SP Grid webpage on RAW, but we also have some other sources. There's uh, the RAW website, which I've included a link for here, uh, and a bitly shortened link. And that has detailed up-to-date tutorials and tutorial data, data. It has a detailed manual. It's got links to the tutorial videos. And it has installation instructions. Uh, for example, if you're not using an SP Grid machine and you want to use your personal laptop as well, uh, you can just grab some installers from there, including pre-built installers for Mac and Windows. So in addition to that, uh, we also have tutorial videos on YouTube, which are older, and we're working on updating them, but they're still more or less accurate. We've included those details uh, to links here. And then finally, if you need to get help, uh, we very recently have built a new mailing list uh, or a Google group, really, for RAW, so you can go there to get some help. And you can always email me as well. And my email is on the RAW website. So that's kind of the, the rough breakdown. That's, that's an overview of the program. I want to show you a little bit about how to actually use it now. So hopefully this will work and you're now seeing the program and not just uh, my desktop. If it isn't, I'm sure Jason will tell me. So this is the main interface to the program here. So what you're seeing on the left, uh, there's a control panel, which is where you're going to control things, generally speaking. And on the right is a plot panel, which will show the data that we're interested in. So currently, we're in the Files tab. So this is essentially your interface to the operating system. This is just showing you what's on disk. This is where you're going to load files from, uh, things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some images. So I'm going to go into the Standards Data folder. This is all example data, I should say, that's available on the RAW website. This is going to be a very abbreviated version of the tutorial, actually. So I went into the Standards Data folder just by double-clicking on it. Uh, and there's a bunch of detector images in here from our beamline. So before we can load any images, the first thing we have to do is we have to load a configuration file. So when you're processing images into 1D curves, you need a mask to block out things like the beam stop. You need to know where the beam center is, how far away the detector was. All those bits and pieces are saved in a config file. And so you can either make that yourself, uh, I just double click to load it, or it might be made by your Beamline scientist, depending on where you're getting your data and how you're using RAW. So I loaded the config. So now all the parameters I need to process images are in the program. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is load a set of images. So I just, I'm going to select them by shift clicking like you normally would and click plot. And you should see all these images have now appeared on the main plot. Uh, so over here, we're seeing each scat individual scattering profile that I just loaded. And if I go to the manipulation tab, this is where you'll see a list of the profiles that have been loaded into RAW. So this is the data that's, that's in the program right now. So this is a buffer curve. Uh, if you're familiar with SACS or if you remember from my introduction a little earlier, we usually measure buffer and protein. So I'm just going to load the protein here from the files tab by clicking plot. You can see it there. So we go back to manipulation. Now we have 20 profiles loaded. So this is a lot. And we don't need to work with the individual pro profiles. What we want to do typically is check them for radiation damage or other problems that might occur from the data collection, like clipping a meniscus when you're oscillating a sample plug. And then we average them. So I know this data is good. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and average it. Again, just by shift clicking, I'm selecting all the buffer profiles. You can see they have buff in the name. And then I'm just going to click on the average button. That creates an average. It's hard to see because it's right on top of all the other profiles. So I'm going to use this hide button here just to hide those other scattering profiles from the plot. And now you can see our average is the only one that's in that buffer range. 
I'm going to do the same thing for the protein. I'm going to select it. I'm going to average it. And then I'm going to hide it. And so now you see the two averages are shown on the plot. So once you have these, you want to proceed with subtraction. So you just mark the buffer by clicking the star. Click on the uh, protein scattering profile and click the subtract button. And you'll see a subtracted profile appears on the plot on the bottom. So now there's a bunch of things you might want to do to start analyzing this data. And I should mention, as I do these operations, new things are appearing in the manipulation tab. So these are the, the different bits of data I've generated, the averages, and now the subtracted file. So uh, there are lots of things you might want to do once you've generated or once you've loaded, depending on how your workflow goes, once you have a subtracted profile in raw. So one of those things uh, might be to plot it different ways. So if you right click on the plot, you can see you can select a, a bunch of different axes. So maybe I want to look at the crack key axis or crack key plot and see if this protein looks folded or not. OK, good enough. Uh, let me try the log lin and just pop back there and make sure that looks like I expected to. So you can, you can change the display in that way very easily. Uh, but you can also do more advanced analysis, of course. Typically, in a SACS workflow, the first thing you're going to do is a guinea A fit. This is going to tell you whether your data is aggregated, maybe you're having repulsive interactions, or you've over subtracted something. It's a good first quality check. So by right clicking on the profile and then scrolling down the right click menu, You'll see there's a Guinea AFIT option. Uh, so I'm just going to select that, and that's going to pop up a, a new window on top of our old, uh, on top of the main one. And this is the Guinea AFIT window. So uh, we've implemented an automatic uh, Guinea AFIT program. So whenever you open a profile here, it tries to automatically fit the, the best range. And then you can manually adjust it by uh, moving the the starting or ending points here. So it looks like this data is probably still good all the way down. So I'm going to bump and min down to, to pull in that low Q and then maybe bump that out one point. So that that lets you see the, the guinea I fit on this top plot here, which is a, a log of I versus Q squared, and then the residual to that fit here. And so this lets you do all the typical things that you want to do with a guinea fit, right? You're looking for a flat residual. You're looking for uh, no upticks or downturns at low Q. Uh, and so you can, you can very quickly assess the quality. You can see over here in the parameters box, we've got I0 and RG, which are the parameters you'd like to get out of the fit. Uh, so, and those are saved with the scattering profile when I click OK. Um, you'll actually see up here in the info box at the top, now with this profile selected in red, or rather the red profile selected, in the info box, you know, so we filled in the RG and I0 panels. So once you've done a, a guinea fit, the next thing to kind of assess data quality might be to find the molecular weight. So again, if you right click and then you go to the right click menu, there's a molecular weight option. So I'm just going to select that. And that pops up a molecular weight panel. Um, so this has four different methods of calculating molecular weight. It's actually fairly challenging to get an accurate molecular weight out of small angle X-ray scattering data. And different methods fail in different circumstances, which is why we've included four different methods in this uh, format. So for two of them, you need to know your sample concentration. Uh, if my memory serves, this sample is 0 0.4248 mg per mil. Uh, and so when I fill that in, you can see the mole weight populated in two different panels. And so now we're looking at uh, the four different methods. And so these each have, if you click more info, it'll tell you about the method. When it fails, it'll give you a citation. Um, you can click show details to see kind of the details of the method and evaluate whether it's worked properly for your sample or not. And I'm not going to go through because this is a a fairly short talk. I'm not going to go through when each of these methods is applicable, but if you want to learn more about them, you can open up RAW and click on more info. Uh, and so all the pieces I should mention, uh, there's some advanced parameters that you might need to set properly. Those can all be changed by clicking the Change Advanced Parameters button, which again, I'm not going to demo just due to limited time. 
so I click OK, the mall weight's saved. You can see it's propagated into the mall weight box in the info panel. And that uh, is kind of the basics you might do besides just looking at the scattering profile for evaluating the quality of the, the system. So the next thing typically in a, a SACS data processing approach that you do is you would uh, do an inverse Fourier transform. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. There are two different methods in RAW for doing IFTs. I'm going to use GNOME because that's what most people are familiar with. So when I right click again on the subtracted profile and click on the GNOME window, it opens up a uh, PFR window. So what you're seeing on the left is controls and outputs, and what you're seeing on the right is a plot of, on the top, the P of R function. And uh, on the bottom, your data, and then the, the fit to the data from the P of R function. This is the, the smoothed curve that you get back out of the P of R function. So uh, here, again, it automatically it uses one of the AdSAS utilities to automatically try to pick a Dmax. But once you've done that, you can dynamically adjust your maximum dimension. You can watch the parameters change down here. You can truncate the scattering profile if that's what something you want to do. And you can change all the advanced parameters as well. So I'm not going to go into, again, how to determine an appropriate maximum dimension because that's a lecture in and of itself. But you have all the tools here to let you figure that out. Uh, evaluations of the fit, the comparison of the, the RG and I0 to what you got from the Guinea fit, and the kind of qualitative analysis that NAM outputs. So when I click OK, what it's going to do is it's going to generate the IFT profile. And that's going to show up in the IFT manipulation panel and the IFT plot. Uh, so you're actually seeing two things here. I'm going to hide one of them, um, which I uh, just so now I'm showing just the, the P of R function that we generated. So this is again on the top, just what we were seeing before. This is the, the P of R function, the paired distance distribution. On the bottom, you have the, the raw data and the fit to the data from the P of R function. So typically from here, what you might do is you might try to generate an envelope for your system, this, these low resolution envelopes that you can get out of SACS data, uh, dock with crystal structures, things like that. And again, RAW lets you do that. So to do that, what you do is you right click on the IFT you're interested in, and you go to the run dam if dam in uh, here. That takes a little while to run. So I've already run it for this other data set, which happens to be Lysozyme. So I'm just going to pull up that window here. So this is what the, the dam if dam in window looks like. For those of you familiar with, with this program, it, or I should say with dam if dam in, the, the settings here should look very familiar. You get to choose the number of reconstructions you're going to do. Uh, it'll start them simultaneously up to the number of cores in your computer. You pick the program and the mode and the symmetry, the anisometry. You can change all the advanced settings. And then you can also, uh, after you've done the reconstructions, align them with damaver and then refine them with damin. So you'd click Start once you get everything set the way you would. And you'd see a bunch of output over here as it all ran. Uh, and then down here, you'd see the output from each individual program and these tabs that I'm just kind of clicking through very quickly. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the brief overview. So I should mention that. What I'm showing you right now is raw 1.3.0. It's currently in beta, and I haven't released it yet. And so there's some features that are new that you wouldn't see if you opened up raw right now on your own computer. One of those is this results panel in Damn or Damif. So this results panel is kind of compiling all the, the pieces of the, the previous, uh, from the previous run or from the previous tab, all the pieces of all those individual outputs into a nice easy table you can look at. So it reports on the ambiguity of the reconstruction using ambimeter, reports the normalized spatial discrepancy, how many of the uh, reconstructions actually got included. It reports the ensemble resolution from SASRES. Uh, and then it reports the chi-squareds, RGs, Dmaxes, excluded volume, molecular weight uh, for each of the reconstructions. And we've also implemented a very basic viewer. It's not Pymol, but it gives you an idea without having to open anything else of what your thing looks like. And I should say that for Lysozyme, it's going to look like a flat blob. So if you're seeing a flat blob on my screen right now. That's exactly what you should be seeing. Um, that's kind of the level of detail that you get out of these envelopes typically.
So uh, those are all saved on disk, I should say. These are all run and saved on disk. They're not in raw. So once you're done, you'd click close, and that would close that window. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about SexSax. So for just a moment, I'm going to flip back to the presentation. Um, let's see if I can get this up and running again. OK, so uh, what is size exclusion chromatography coupled SAX? So hopefully now you're seeing my PowerPoint slides again. Uh, so size exclusion chromatography coupled SAX is a technique that's only gotten popular relatively recently in the last five or so years, I'd say. And what you do is you, you take a sample and you run it through a sizing column, or in some cases, other types of columns. I've seen this with ion exchange as well. Uh, but you run it through a separation column of some type. And then instead of collecting fractions from the column, you run the output directly through your SAC cell. There's no fractions collected. And data is collected continuously during elution. So uh, on in the slide here, I have kind of a schematic picture that I've borrowed from a, a friend of mine, Steve Meisberger. And you see you have buffer running through a sample pump, goes through the sample loop into the sizing column through whatever detectors you have, like UV and conductivity, and then into the X-ray cell, and you collect data as you're flowing it through. So this is a great technique because a lot of proteins are, are not very stable once you prepare them. They aggregate. They do things that make the SACS data bad. And using this technique, there's not a lot of time for them to do that, right? You can directly separate these things out. Uh, but the downside is, or not really the downside, but the, the caveat is you're generating a lot of data, right? By continuously collecting data through the peaks, you end up with two, three, hundred, maybe even a thousand uh, X-ray images. And so very recently, people have started developing new ways to analyze all that pile of images. So we have a way of doing that in RAW. So I'm going to show you that now. So now I'm back to the RAW screen. So I'm going to go back to the Files tab here, and I'm going to navigate up a level and then into this uh, sec data folder. So this has a bunch of example sec data. So I'm going to go to the sample 2. And to load this as a sec curve, I'm just going to select all of them and hit plot sec. And so now if I go to the sec tab here, uh, you see there's some controls that I haven't used yet. And we're on the sec plot. You should see something that looks more or less like a chromatograph. So what this is, is it's showing us uh, integrated intensity versus frame number. And so basically, proteins scatter more than buffer. So what you look at is you have something analogous to a UV chromatograph coming off a sizing column where it's flat in the buffer. And then as the protein comes out, it goes up. Uh, and then it comes back down as you get back into buffer. So if you kind of stare closely at this, it may be hard to see on your screens, I'm not sure. But there is actually a main peak, and then there's a little shoulder here. So if you saw this on a chromatograph, you'd stare at it and say, well, maybe I didn't get full separation. And the same thing is, is happening here. So what can RAW do with this? Well, uh, kind of the very first thing, the basic analysis that we put in for this is you, you pick a buffer range. I'm not really going to show you how, but I'm going to pick a, a buffer range, put it into this buffer range boxes here. And then I'm going to click the Set Update Parameters button. And so what this is going to do, and it's going to take a little while, which is why I started it while I'm talking, is it's going to uh, average every five frames based on that window size parameter. And it's going to move this average along the curve. Oh, there we go. And it's going to subtract from each of those averaged windows uh, the buffer average between 50 and 100. And it's going to try to calculate the radius of gyration, the molecular weight uh, for each of that set. And so what this does then is it produces what we're seeing here, which is the radius of gyration plotted as a function of frame number against the integrated intensity. So you can also change this by right clicking. You can change this to molecular weight, which is what I'm showing now. And so this really lets you get a feel for what's in your data. Not only can you get a quick look at kind of the size of the thing that came out in your of your column, but it also lets you see these kind of features that are a little harder to see in the integrated plot. So you notice the molecular weight starts out quite high over here on the left, and then it drops down and levels out. And what that's telling us is that we have a mixed species in there, right? There's there's something large in that shoulder. And then as you move uh, towards the right, as the evolution continues, um, you're getting something that's leveled out. And now it's just a constant one species. So 
if you're happy with that, if you have a nice range where it looks like you have one species and you have good separation and you're satisfied, then you can go to this data to main plot box and you can say, well, okay, so I need the buffer that was frames 50 to 100, send the average to the main plot. And then the, the sample, uh, I know this sample, so I'm not gonna show you really how, but you know, uh, for this one kind of frames 210 to 220 are pretty good. So I'm gonna send those to the main plot. And then if we were to go back to the main plot panel, and I'm going to turn off the GI profiles to make this more clear. There you have uh, a buffer in green uh, and a sample in red that we just extracted from the sex x curve. I can subtract them like I did and generate a scattering profile on the bottom plot now. And so that's that's kind of the basic version of sex x analysis. But you can do more. You can say, well, what if this, you know, this isn't fully separated, right? How am I sure that I'm really getting a clean profile off of that part on the right and it doesn't have a little bit of contaminant from the from the, the shoulder there? So if you right click on the, the item in the SEC control panel and you select EFA, this allows you to do evolving factor analysis. So what this does is it's a, a model free way to separate out different components and sex axe peaks. And I'm not really going to go into detail on how it works. It starts out with a, a singular value decomposition. You use that to determine the number of components of any significance in your data set. In this case, it's three. Raw I've figured that out correctly. Uh, then you create what are called forward and backward evolving factor plots, which are what we're showing here. So these, uh, essentially, you do SVD for the first frame, the first two frames, the first three frames, et cetera, and you plot the, the significant singular values, you plot their magnitude, and where they start to go up is where that component is starting to come into your data set. So you adjust uh, raw to tell it where the component's starting in the data set, um, and it tries to guess, but it can be challenging, especially if there's a couple inflection points. Uh, so I'm just going to do this quickly because I don't want to run too over time. Uh, so you tell it where your data is starting and ending, or rather where the components in your data are starting and ending. So for this data set, it's around here. Let's see, I'm adjusting the, the sliders or the tickers here, and I've adjusted these circles for the starting points here. So then you click Next, and what it does is it uses that extra information you've given it to rotate the singular value decomposition vectors back into scattering profiles. So there's some controls for that rotation here, but what you're seeing is now the ranges that you selected in this top left plot, and then in the right plots, the scattering profiles that extracted from the overlapping data, and then some more information about those. So again, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here. There's some optimization we could do, but this is good enough for, for demo purposes. So if you get to this stage and you're happy with your profiles, you click Done. That sends them back to this main plot in the manipulation menu. So I scroll down to the bottom. There are three new profiles here. Um, one of them, well, here. So I'm going to move them to the bottom plot because that'll be easier to see. Uh, so we've got three profiles on this bottom plot. One of them, this uh, pink one that I just made bold, is obviously junk. Um, it, it corresponds to a salt peak that came out at the end of the buffer. But there are two components here that look like protein. And you'll notice that one of them, this brown one that I've just highlighted here, um, is actually very similar to what we got off of the left side of the peak. If I were to scale those two together, just by applying a scale factor, turn off this purple one, you'll see that the brown and the orange are essentially identical. So we were able to get a pure component off of our peak, but by de doing the deconvolution, we're able to verify that. And then once you have these, you can carry out all the analysis I just showed you in RAW and kind of continue from there. So there's a lot more that RAW can do, but I, uh, I know that it's hard to watch someone play with a program on your computer screen and not be able to do it in person. And also, I was told to keep this talk to kind of 30 to 40 minutes. So at this point, uh, I'm just going to go back to the presentation. And I'm going to end it up. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jesse. So if anyone uh, has questions, you can send them to me by chat. And uh, I had uh, one question, just not being familiar with the technique for the um, the, uh, the SEC uh, approach, 
what sort of concentrations do you need to load initially on your gel filtration column so that by the time it elutes, you have something that's sort of measurable by, by SACS? So that's a really good question. And the answer is, it depends on the column you're using and the facility you're at. So generally speaking here at MacChess, uh, our, we, we provide kind of two semi-analytic columns for users, uh, SuperDex uh, 10300 and SuperDex 5150. So if you're using the short 5150, by the time you get from loading to the SAC cell, you've had a dilution by a factor of maybe three to four. If you're using the larger column, which gets better separation, you have a dilution of maybe 10 to 12. Um, and so you start out with kind of, you estimate the concentration you need for SACs based on the molecular weight, and that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then you kind of work back from there to, to concentrate up as much as you can to get to this three to 10 increase. Great. Um, another question that I had was for the different uh, software that's when you call the sort of sub programs within, uh, those are installed uh, within RAW. Is that that's correct? So users don't have to worry about dependencies between software or using uh, things that are also installed in other places. Uh, so True and false, depending on which program you're referring to. So we've tried to put as much as we can into RAW, but there are any of the programs from the AtSAS data set, uh, they are licensed such that they cannot be redistributed with other programs and such that only academics can access them for free. And so those programs have to be downloaded separately and then RAW automatically detects them and hooks them into the program. Uh, if you don't have them, the options just won't appear in the right-click menu. Uh, things like the Guinea fit, the molecular weight, the evolving factor analysis, the Bayesian inverse Fourier transform, all that is things that we've built into Python uh, as we go. And if, if when we ever get around to, or someone else gets around to creating Python-based open source versions of the AdSAS software, we'll very happily use that instead. Yeah, I'll note that those are available with a license for academic users. You can apply for your license, send it to us, and we'll add it to your install, and then they should just work with RAW. Um, but you do need to get a license from the researchers at EMBL, as all EMBL software uh, does require a license. Um, uh, all right, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, it was a really great webinar, and um, uh, I'll follow up with you uh, online by email. Yeah, great. Thank you for having me. Bye.